Case Western Reserve University's Great Thinker series proudly presents the Origin Science Scholars Program. These lectures are presented by the Institute for the Science of Origins, a partnership of Case Western Reserve University, the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, and IdeaStream. With the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, the College of Arts and Sciences, and Media Vision. This evening, it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Giuseppe Strangi, Professor of Physics and Ohio Research Chair on Surface and Advanced Materials. Uh, he did his work, his laurea, and his PhD at the University of Calabria in Italy, where he was on the faculty before coming to Case Western Reserve University in 2012. He leads the From Life to Life initiative that involves uh, scientific research around the world looking at how biological systems can inspire solutions to human challenges. In, 20, in this 2015, the International Year of Light, Dr. Strangi will talk to us about light in the nano world, and it's my pleasure to introduce my, introduce my friend and colleague. It's truly a pleasure for me to be here and to talk to you about light in the nano world which is part of my research program here at Case Western Reserve University. And thank you. And light in the nano world, we are all aware um, that light is of great importance for the humanity and for all forms of life. Through photosynthesis, for example, light generates life. We, are, we see because of light, but let me add that we understand because of light. We understand because of light. We explore in science the nano world as well as the universe by using light to understand mechanisms, processes, and to gain understandings, we need to explore, but we need the right tools to explore. And light is an excellent tool. In science, as I said, we use light to explore, but we use also light to activate, destroy, when it's the case to destroy. For example, we are fighting cancer by using light, but we are detecting markers for cancer by using light as well. Most of the time when we use the word, I understand, or I see, we intend the same stuff. We see when we understand, or we understand when we see. 2015, is International Year of Light. The United Nations declared this for the utmost importance of light for humanity, for health, for environment, for social, culture, nature. And for all this reason was declared the International Year of the Light. Today I would like to take you in this journey to the nano world by riding photons and electromagnetic waves and by using materials that are not readily available in nature. We call these materials metamaterials. Let me outline the talk. These are, I will talk about the International Area of Light, but I will talk about light in science and technology. I will talk about how to beam light in the nano world, what kind of materials we use to mold the flow of light and to beam light in the nano world, how to extract information from this world. And light-based applications, you will see all these topics, but I will talk about healthcare, about the nanomedicine, how light can be used for that. As I said, the International Year of Light, this is the page that appeared in Paris, the first pair in light 2015, when the UNESCO declared in February of this year the International Year of the Light for all communications, economy, environment, social, culture, nature, and so on and so on. For the great potential that there is in light 
and light-based technologies. Why light? Light because the science and applications of light creates these technologies which are revolutionary. Most of the time are unseen. We are not aware of that. But they directly improve the quality of life worldwide. At the same time, these technologies are a major economic drivers. They will revolutionize this century in the same way in which electronics did for the last century. But we need to take this opportunity. In order to do that, we need to define clear themes, cross-cutting activities. We need to talk, communicate with the public in order to have these cross-cutting activities going from science to technology. And this is not a simple step. It's a very difficult step. Tech transfer, it's not easy. But we have to put all our efforts in order to do that and translate that to nature and culture. Why 2015? Because it celebrates major anniversaries. Look at the number 15, how many times appears <laughs> here. It's extremely interesting than exactly a millennium ago, 1,000 years ago, the first book of optics appeared. It was Ibn Al-Aytham who wrote this book. Extremely interesting. 1815, eight centuries after. Huygens and Fresnel, they both came up with an idea about the nature of light as a wave. They have the proof of that. But only 50 years later, 1865, a brilliant Scottish mathematician came with four equations and a beautiful paper, extremely stunning. To stand in front of this paper was for me a great experience, the original manuscript. I can tell you that he wrote in this equation something about, in this paper, something about light, and it was 1865. 1915, general relativity, we all know. And in next two sessions, Professor Tolley and Professor Deram, they will talk about general relativity. Light in space and time is, was at the core of the entire theory. 1965, cosmic microwave background. In science, is a very important topic, as well as optical fiber technology for communication. Cow, 1965. For all these reasons, for the celebrations, and for many others that I will try to tell now, wave nature of light, Huygens, and particle nature of light, Newton. So in 15 years, they created this kind of a duality. Again, 15. Electromagnetism, Maxwell, 1873. A lot of time after. We see that in these four equations, he was able to put the entire electromagnetism. And we know how important it is. Our heart beats because of the electromagnetism. Understanding electromagnetism, it means understanding our brain, how we think, and many other stuff. Last century, quantum theory, Planck, Photon, Einstein, relativity, again, Einstein. Wave particle duality, Debray, 1924. That was fantastic. At that time, at the end of the speech in Zurich, Einstein came and wrote a beautiful sentence. Now we have two theories. Both are indispensable, but without any logical connection. So he admitted that this theory was valid that we have a duality, we have to resolve the duality. And then, Nobel Prize for laser, Nicholas Blumbergen. I had the fortune to meet him when I was in Italy, 1995, in my lab. He was running around, already Nobel Prize at that time, but giving a lot of insight about what we were doing in our project. 
Nicholas and Schwaller in 1981 got the Nobel Prize for laser light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. And it was a, a revolution for light-based application. 50 years, and we all know about that. But as I said, it was a great experience for me to, in the British Museum in London, when I was in front of this, of this paper. This is the original manuscript of Maxwell, in which he wrote, he submitted this to the secretary of this journal, Transaction, and you see who is the charge stocks, who was the reviewer of this work, Lord Kelvin. So amazing people working around and accepting this work. And he defined the light as an electromagnetic disturbance propagated through the field according to electromagnetic laws. I think that at that time, the word disturbance was more about perturbation. It was not a real disturbance. So wave particle duality of light. This is the beautiful and interesting sentence that he wrote at that time without any logical connection. But indeed, there was evidence for wave nature of light, diffraction and interference. Huygens and Fresnel. Both were thinking of light about two fields, the electric and magnetic field, dancing each other and generating each other while dancing. And these are dancing in orthogonal plane and the wave propagates. Evidence for particle nature of light, photoelectric effect, Compton effect. But it was again Einstein to explain this, to explain the photoelectric effect by introducing the concept of light quantum, the photon, a massless particle bringing energy. And energy is a packet of energy which is unsplittable, a quantum. But the way particle duality was resolved by Richard Feynman, 1965 with a quantum field theory. Now, nowadays, when we talk about what the theories we have to use going across scales and times, if we go and look at different sides and different speed, uh, we recognize that at scale of the universe and for phenomena which occurs at low speed, we use classical mechanics, Newton. But when we go to something which is extremely small, Hathen, which moves extremely fast at the speed of light, we have to use the quantum field theory. And we have to use a new science, the nanophotonics. So what is the nanophotonics? It's the science of light-mother interaction at the nanoscale. And then again, the question, what is the nanoscale? The nanoscale is the scale where, if you will look at them, uh, you know, human hair, 10 to minus 4 meter, you know, a tenth of a millimeter, and then we go to red blood cell, we are approaching a millionth of meter, the microns, then bacteria exactly at a, a micrometer, but viruses, DNA, and molecular structure belongs to this nano world, where we work with the nanophotonics. And it's exactly the scale of the nano world that I would like to present to you today. Virus, DNA, molecular structures. But nanophotonics, nanomedicine, nanoelectronics are all daughters of the same mother, nanotechnology. The nanotechnology is the control of matter on nanoscale. And without these materials, without controlling the materials at the nanoscale, we cannot beam light at this scale. We cannot see objects at this scale. We cannot manipulate objects, activate, destroy. So nanophotonics, 
is working. I just show you a few examples. Quanu dots. We are nanoparticles from three to seven nanometers luminescent. They luminesce. And the luminescence is depending on the size. It's a quantum confinement effect. Dendrimers. There are special polymers which control of excitation dynamics. They release oxygen species, very reactive species. They're used to fight cancer. Plasmonic arrays, small nano antenna to change the properties of materials on nanoscale. Photonic crystal to manipulate the propagation of light, split information, recombine it. And nanotrapping, the way to focus light in this world and to manipulate objects. When did uh, people start looking at the nanoscale? It was 15 years ago exactly when the first instruments allowed to get to the nanoscale. But the idea to get to the nanoscale, it was 1968, when Victor Vesalago did a bizarre experiment, but it was a theoretical experiment, to look at a, a part of material that were not possible to approach at the time, even, you know, not yet conceived. And it was exactly the date in which people started to think about the nano world. Thank you for joining us. You've been watching Dr. Giuseppe Strangi discussing light in science and technology, what it is and how we use it. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu. In the next part of the talk, Dr. Strangi discusses how to use light as a tool when manipulating materials on the scale of nanometers, tens to hundreds of atoms across. Now, back to the talk. So the question is how to beam light in the nano world. We need materials to get in the nano world. And this material is to be, have to be structured so that we can mold the flow of light and beam light in this, in this world. But again, what is the nano world? You can see that you know, we go all the way through from millimeters to micrometers to nanometer, 10, a billionth of meter. If we see that here we have a strand of DNA which is only two nanometer wide, but we can have, for example, biomodels at this scale, which are proteins, or we can have hormones, we can have all class of materials that fall in this, at this scale, and including nanostructures which are fabricated by human beings, artificial materials. So how we call these materials we call metamaterials, which are artificially engineered materials, which usually have properties that you do not find in natural occurring materials. And because you want to beam it, beam light in the nano world, you need these materials with special properties. A natural material has atoms, and organization of these atoms will give you these properties, the special property of the materials. But we thought that maybe we can create artificial atoms and organize them. The property of the single unit plus the organization gives new properties. And we are moving here at this scale where the size of the structure is much smaller than the wavelength of the light. So now, what about the wavelength of the visible light? What about the length of the light? The length of the light in the visible is half micrometer. You think a million of a meter, take half of that, and it will be the length of the wavelength. Extremely small. But we are thinking of structures much smaller than that. Let's say a billionth of meter. How it's possible to design and fabricate materials at that scale? It was inconceivable up to 10, 20 years ago. Now is a reality. And with that, we are aiming to have super lens based on metamaterials, a lens which is able to resolve and to see, for example, DNA image by using light. Light is much larger than DNA, but how you can see it? By using special properties and beating the diffraction limit. 
you see, for example, you can write structure only 90 nanometers. Detection is very important, biorecognition. How you can detect a single molecule in order to avoid the problem of the false negative during a test, a blood test, where we are looking for a marker. Most of the time is not possible because we have no enough sensitivity, not enough specificity. And because of that, we need metamaterials. We need metamaterials, maybe we need for clocking. I have to tell that invisibility is a concept that is studied in the framework of metamaterials. I will not present anything about that, but just to tell that if you, what, what is clocking? You know, making an object invisible, it seems that you have to cancel the scattering of light. Canceling the scattering and the reflection, you will make this object invisible. You wrap this object in a special material so that the phase and amplitude of light will remain unmodified. No scattering, no visible. And nanolasers, small object able to generate light, to generate light. These objects are extremely useful for nanomedicine nowadays. How to guide light in the nano world? We do special structures, and the special structures usually have a tip, and the tip goes exactly in the nano world. We shine light on these gratings, couple light with the electrons, the electrons start to oscillate. Think about the exilience of electrons oscillating at the same frequency of the light. And because of that, we will guide this wave, which we call polaritons, in the nano world. And once it's in the nano world, it interacts with objects, and some acceptor will send us back the information of what the light saw inside the nano world. And this is the antenna that has been done in Italy, in the Italian Institute of Technology, with a lens and a tip to enter the nano world. It was 2011. Trapping of light in solar cell is extremely important to make the systems today to harvest energy from, su from the sun and to make the system efficient and translate to technological world. But interestingly, you can use hybrid systems, for example, nanostructures and biological materials, DNA strand. And this DNA strand will try to organize materials, help to assemble materials. And this is what we call DNA origami. It's a technique well known now, well developed now, in order to organize materials at the nanoscale. We ask nature to help us to organize materials and go from bottom up, from the single object to the material that we can handle. This is the approach that we take, single nanobjects, and we go all the way up to the macro scale. Organize materials, create our atom, organize them, and we get to the macro scale. This is an example of a nanoparticle that we did in collaboration with a group in Spain. But we also borrow ideas from nature, forms and functions. We all know all these relationships. Most of the time we have to ask nature, if I want this function, what kind of form I need? I need, for example, in the case of superhydrophobic texture, I need a lotus leaf. This protrusion are there on top of the leaves in order to get a, a hydrophobic platform where the nutrients in the water are absorbed only in some specific sites, not everywhere. We have only few nutrients. We cannot waste it. So, for example, this is the way in which we build up hydrophobic platforms and so on. But we borrow ideas from nature. Other structures, all based on ideas that we find in nature, and all with a specific function. 
we use forces at the nanoscale, the same forces that we use, for example, in um, the real world. We use optical forces, Coulomb force, in electrostatic interaction between charges. Ampere force, Lorentz Laplace force, all these forces are accessible in the nano world, either having random interaction or asking to have, for example, a specific interaction between two of these objects, two of these nanostructures. Optical tweezers is a one single aspect of all this story that I want to show you. What is optical tweezer? It's the way to manipulate nano objects in the nano world. And this is a setup that we usually use. This, uh, we use radiation force that stems from the conservation of the electromagnetic momentum. Light has a momentum. We use this momentum in order to trap objects and move objects, but in the nano world. We use this setup, simple one, laser, is focused in trap region, and this is how it looks like. An object is moving, this is a nanotube, is moving in this fluid here, undergoing a Brownian motion, but as we, the, laser, the laser is on, we see that the environment, the background is still moving, but the object is trapped. The trap is active. And once you trap it, what do you do? If I want, if I wish, I can move it. I can bring in a specific position where I want, I want to start it, I want to create. This is the way in which we manipulate objects at this scale. For example, we can also do optical binding. In other words, we use evanescent standing waves generated by laser beam which enters the the material, this cell, where we have, for example, nanotubes. In this specific case, these are the same tobacco mosaic virus that Dr. Steinmetz showed us last time. We are aligning them by hand to hand by using these evanescent waves. You see that when the beam is on, they stay along the same line. But when the light is off, they swim freely. And you will see in a while, they swim freely. And this is because of strong optical anisotropy. Most of the time you want to do this for a specific reason. Why does the laser work to trap the particle? What is it about the laser that does that? That's an amazing question. Thank you. It offers me the opportunity to tell a little bit more about that. Thank you very much. So laser light is coherent light. It's monochromatic light. It means that at the same color and at the same time is extremely focused. So you can manipulate it and you can beam and focus in a very small volume. At that volume, I'm talking about few micrometers cubic, you have, we have an extreme intense light. That light carries a momentum, and this momentum is transferred to the nanoparticle because of the reflection on this object and because of the scattering of the light we create a gradient surrounding this. And we create a cage, a trap. In, there is much less energy inside than outside. It minimizes the energy. So if you think what has been done and in the past, maybe you are not aware, but I will tell you that Bose-Einstein condensation was based on this experiment. It's just a daughter of that experiment in which they tried to trap here in the US, in Boulder, Colorado, they won the Nobel Prize in 2001, Eric Cornell and Clayman, 
because they were able to trap objects and freeze them. This is the idea behind the optical traps. At the end of this talk, I will show you at the border between science fiction and science facts, what we are doing with these optical tweezers. Taking objects, bringing it around the world, and approaching single cells. I watched the uh, slide with the Brownian motion, and I got the impression generally that objects at the nanomaterial size were fragile or transitory. Is how stable or or um, firm are the pro are the materials that the, that are nanomaterials? So it depends what kind of materials we handle. And depending on the materials, we have to use the proper light. Let's say if we have biological materials, we do not want to use any UV light because we know that the interaction between UV light and biological materials can be deleterious, can, can destroy this material. So the interaction can be minimized by choosing the proper wavelength. Not only that. So to answer the question, how fragile are they? Most of the time, our nanostructures, this nanostructure in metal or metal dielectric hybrid, and they are very stable, very stable. After a month, you still are there doing experiments, and they are stable. Most of the time, with the biological objects, for example, the experiment with the viruses. Viruses are what we call our Trojan horses that we send in the cells. But most of the time, they don't want to run. So we have to use much more energy than, use in, than we are used to, to our nests, in order to move them. And then we destroy them. But we know what is the limit. Most of the time, we can decide what light we have to use what intents do we have to use? But you're right. When we use biological materials, they are not. So I wonder if you could go back to that slide with the DNA. Absolutely, I can. It looks wonderful. How, <clears throat> how do you make that happen? Oh, ho. That's, that's, that's interesting. So it was back in 2008. I will tell you a brief story, OK? When we were working in the National Research Council, and we decided to use nanoparticles in order to see if it's possible to study uh, the DNA base pairs, nine and six base pairs of DNA, and try to see, for example, they are at the same scale of the nanoparticles, what kind of interaction they have, simply, naively. And we said, if we have nanoparticles of 10 nanometers and the DNA strain is 10 nanometers, they will tend to organize. But we never thought that they will organize by helping each other to align. And then we went to see what happens. And adenine and cytosine were mainly attaching to small objects and timine to large objects. And later on, we understood that it was related to the chirality of the structures. So it was as usual, as in the case of graphene, you know how we did Novoselov, just using a piece of tape on a, on, a, on a pencil, and he removed the graphene, and he won the Nobel Prize. We didn't win the Nobel Prize, unfortunately not, but but it was an amazing experiment. And you see here, 5, 8, 18, these are all related to the length of the base pairs. And these are called DNA origami. You can find plethora of works about that right now. So you use lasers to, to generate the light. It, does it matter what element uh, you use to generate the lasers, what color? Uh, you use? OK. So usually, uh, you know, there are visible lasers and invisible lasers. Um, we use visible lasers, so in the range of 400 nanometer to 700, so from blue to red. 
most of why this? Because we know that working with biological materials, for example, we know what kind of interaction we have to expect for each single color. And we use invisible light, which is near infrared, to enter in what we call biological windows, when, which is close to red. The same effect when we push the button of the lift of the elevator and we see light, red light going through. This is because it's a biological window. We make light passes, do not interact with water, that light. So what light we use? Mainly we use visible light, red light. We prefer it. We hope you've been enjoying the Origin Science Scholars Program with Dr. Giuseppe Strangi. Dr. Strangi directs the Nanoplasm Lab at Case Western Reserve University. In the second part of our talk, we learned about optical metamaterials, artificially engineered materials with properties that are not encountered in nature. In our final segment, Dr. Strangi will discuss the applications of materials with new optical properties. Now, back to our talk. So in the last part of my talk, I will talk about applications of metamaterials. You see, this is a very large world already. Expanding is a universe which is expanding. Maybe we can apply the inflation theory. And these nanoparticles are at the center of energy, textiles, biomedical, healthcare, agriculture, industrial, electronics, and so on. But we would like to, I would like to focus my attention only in this cone here. Healthcare, nanomedicine. And I would like to talk about the coupling between nanophotonics and theranostics. What is theranostics? It, the mix of two words. Scientists like to do that, to mix therapy and diagnostics, theranostics. So how to use nanophotonics to work in therapy and diagnosis? We usually look at mechanical and thermal impact, at optical effects, when we prepare nanobubbles. In these bubbles, we put nanostructures, luminescent materials, drug, all together. We zip code them and we send to cells that can retain those bubbles. We use light, probe light or pump light in order to excite these bubbles and apply forces for drug delivery, cell disruption, micro and nano surgeries. But all these are therapies, but there is live cell imaging and sensing for diagnosis. For the guidance, we are mainly monitoring bio effects of these plasmonic nanobubbles. Zip coded, as I said, they will go right in the place in which we need. And to be more specific, we use this nano antennae for which are multifunctional nano antennae for imaging photothermal therapy, the way to increase the temperature locally and kill cancer cells. Or to control drug release, stimulate specific immune response, make these materials biocompatible and bioimplantable, or cell-specific targeting zip coding. Surface chemistry, as Professor Stein has told us, in order that we can deliver, and because of affinity, they will attract each other. So sensing is for one of the most important systems. Detection techniques, biorecognition, optical biosensors, are mainly based on nanoparticles or nanostructures where we have captured molecules which are surface immobilized, you see, and they trap molecules on top of them, and because of this, this the signal that we send will change in the presence 
of these molecules. Next generation plasmonic biosensors are made of biochip, reader. We have the sample treatment, the plasmonic detection here. You can see here how it's done. It's a nanosensor, and we use light, LED, light emitting diode, simply in order to read the signal. Light goes through, and we'll see the presence of these objects. What we are doing here at Case Western is to design a photonic biochip where we have a microfluidic channel on top with these small holes where we have these trapped molecules. This is how it looks like, but we implanted it in PDMS, which is a sort of plastics, and we have trapped molecules, captured molecules on top. One, the molecule, cap the captured molecule traps the marker, the cancer marker, the signal will shift. And when it shifts, this is an unfortunate case. This is a positive case. But there is a big problem. Most of the circulating tumor cells, they overexpress enzymes and proteins. Very low molecular weight, very small concentration, low concentration. Most of the time, they will give false negative with the commercially available sensors. So we need something very sensitive to that. How we did? We said, OK, let's use lotus leaf, lotus effect, and let's deliver those few molecules in specific sensitive spots where we can sense them. And the same way in which you know, water molecules deliver on top of this protrusion the nutrients for the leaves. And this is the platform that we designed, protrusion, periodic, at the nanoscale, on top of this photonic chip. And this is the procedure that we, this is the nanostructure, this is the sensing area, the platform. You can see here the sensing spots at the center where we deliver all the molecules in order to sense them. Very small concentration, low molecular weight. Which scale? 50 nanometers. At this scale, what we do, this is the pillars, are hollow pillars on top of the structures. You see these are four micrometers. This is an object of less than 100 nanometers. This is a drop of biological fluid on top of the sensor. When we put the drop there, in the same way that lotus leaf does, it will absorb locally, but not everywhere because the superstrate is hydrophobic. What we add at the end of the procedure is that the molecules indeed are on top of the sensitive spot. You see here these white objects? These are the molecules on top of that. So we are able to deliver those molecules in the sensitive spots and be able to sense it. Other than that, this is diagnosis. What about therapy by using light? This is a cell, and we send nanoparticles which are zip-coded. These nanoparticles can either have an addition on top of the membrane or can be internalized, uptaken. They are inside. Red objects, please follow red objects. Red objects are inside the cell or adhesion on the membrane. And this is before the treatment. Then we shine light on top of that. And what happens that the cancer cell are killed because of, of an irreversible process of denaturation of the proteins. Why this? This is because of heat and luminescence are bought um, as a response for light absorption. Light sh is shined on top of these nanoparticles. We have scattering, but we have luminescence as well as release of heat. So we have an increase of the temperature locally. 
So the question is, OK, so how much is this increase? We all know that in order to have a near instantaneous protein coagulation, we have to go above 60 Celsius. And this is the nanostructure that has been designed for this special experiment. If you see, after this is the temperature and this is the time, after 120 seconds, two minutes of exposure to light, the lo temperature locally goes above 60 degree, which means near instantaneous protein coagulation. Photodynamic therapy, it's very well known, but has a long history, three millennium. Three millennia from here to here, from Egyptian to use light to treat skin disease, Greeks for heliotherapy, but porphyrin were invented in 19, were discovered in 19. What is porphyrin? It's a molecule. This molecule, when it's excited by light, it releases oxygen species, very reactive. Whatever they found around themselves, they will kill it. Now, if we inject the porphyrin, after three days, most of them, they are zip-coded porphyrin. They will be retained by cancer cells. The drug is activated, and the excitation of oxygen is released. And because of that, you know, only, you see, cancer cells are destroyed without affecting surrounding healthy tissues. This is a well-known technique. But as I said, this is very invasive. Today, we are talking about nanomedicine. I will show you an example of nanomedicine, of something that a few years ago was considered to be science fiction. That's why we call it nanospaceships. Nanospaceships for nanomedicine. This is a collaboration that started in 2009 when we were tasked from the European Community Commission, sorry, to work on this special project. The project was creating structures, nanostructures, able to deliver molecules at the nanoscale and use light to activate them. But we need something which are able to do thermoporation, creating an hole in the membrane, opening the membrane, so that we can do this. At that time, we thought about this project, 2009, and in collaboration with Jesper Gluckstad, University of Copenhagen in Denmark, we proposed this spaceship. After that, this was what we did. We started to nanofabricate spaceships. And you see here an object of 10 micrometer, this 10 micrometer object. And the idea is to use trapping laser to move objects around in the bloodstream, in the biological fluids. And a nanocone for term operation, a grading to choose the color of light. And this has to be not only a way to release drug, but even to guide light inside and release light at the end of this tip. You see the diffusion of light, the propagation of this light inside. 2013, the first experiment with fictitious cells and biological fluid. And these fictitious cells are attacked from these nano spaceships. The way to do it is to use laser light, capture and trap them, and move them in this fluid. How we move it? This is the way in which we practice, or oh, Jasper mainly is practicing. It can move up and down. It can get in close proximity to the objective, to the target, and operation, and it can go away. Turn around and go to attack the next one. We hope that this will put 
in the, in the near future, this can put light in the night walk of life. Does this uh, f f nanophototherapy work on all forms of cancer cells? Uh, Photothermal therapy? Yeah, does it work on all forms of cancer oh, cells? This is, a, this is a good question, indeed. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, it works for most kind of cancers. There are some cancers that are very resistant. And we are studying how to look at some special proteins that markers that are released as a resistance to that. And this is, we are doing this with the Cleveland Clinic at um, Urogenital um, Malignancies Program. And we found that, for example, for prostate cancer cell, this is not working as we expect. The reason is that we have not targeting this cell and zip coding them in the proper way. But as soon as this is some more a biological and chemical problem, as soon as we are able to do that, I think that even in this case, because of the temperature that we reach locally, and because of using this particle as Trojan horses and sanding inside, we will be able to kill those cells as well. Through what thickness of tissue will your nano spaceship uh, penetrate? So we are sure that we can go to a couple of centimeters, which is, um, it depends on the laser that we use. In that case, we use green light. The green light has not, uh, is not in the biological window. We were using a special biological fluid to practice how to move, how to move this nano spaceship. But if we use red light, we can enter, or infrared light, near infrared, 1300 nanometer, we can penetrate few centimeters. I was wondering if, as you heat up a local area to 60 degrees centigrade, how broadly does that heat transfer and disperse and what other tissues are injured by that? Yes. Thank you for the question. It offers me the opportunity to make this very clear. So the way we studied this effect was in liquid crystals. So are the same material that we have in our display and we look around this object, uh, what kind of volume is covered by these thermal waves, right? Uh, usually, since we cannot do this work in biological materials to measure um, how much it expands and you know, what, is the, what is the local, what does it mean local in this case, we did in special materials. And we found that indeed it goes up to 10 times the size of the particle, which means in the micron range, which is exactly the size of a cell. You know, we, are, we think that everything will happen in the, in the cell will remain inside the membrane, will not go out of the membrane for a single cell. I wonder what made you decide on this design for the spaceship? What is good what is, about it? What is the idea? Step by step, uh, Jesper, um, my colleague in, in Denmark, he proposed to have something in order to, in order to have a control of this object, we need at least four points. And these four points is because you want to balance it. He was thinking of something about a plane, something about all the systems which are flying needs four points in which you apply forces. And this was Y4. And then we, have, we need a web guide and us to capture light from the top and drive light or propagate light in the other direction. So that's why it has this shape. And then the tip. Very important for poration. We, the tip is metal. All the body is silica, glass. 
It's metal. It's a metal tip. It's a gold tip. The light passing through this cone will be eating up the tip. And in contact with the membrane, will create an all. That's the idea behind all this. Thank you very much. This lecture is part of the Origins Science Scholars Program of the Institute for the Science of Origins, a partnership of Case Western Reserve University, the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, and IdeaStream. It has been brought to you with the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's College of Arts and Sciences, Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, and MediaVision. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, including a full video archive, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu.